slides are ready. Okay, thank you. So my topic is cross-linking with epithelium on is safer. Let us discuss it. Uh, as you know, uh, the, cro the collagen cross-linking has been developed uh, a few years ago by Theo Zeiler, and the aim of it is to strengthen the cornea by increasing the collagen bonds. It is a shift classic irradiating the cornea with UV light after soaking it with riboflavin. Here is a typical example of the cross-linking that everyone knows. This is the classical type, of course. Uh, through the years, is not the topic of this talk, but through the years have been uh, people have, uh, uh, because this is a lengthy procedure, about 30 minute procedure, so people are trying to shorten this time, increasing the, the, uh, the energy of the UV light, and this of course can also be discussed. But this is not the topic here. The topic here is that traditionally the soaking of the cornea with riboflavin is done after epithelium has been removed. That is the EPIOF technique. Of course, as you remove the epithelium, and as you know for the PRK, and also because these corneas are diseased corneas, we can have some complications, like the pain, and like delayed epithelial healing, in even infection, and sometimes we get uh, an important haze. I show you here two slides where we see uh, delayed epithelial helium healing here with the infection and the hypopion, and here some persistent haze after the cross-linking. So this technique, of course, was not ideal, and people tried to, sh to change it. And one way of changing it was to keep the epithelium on. So the, the answer to the question is very easy. Of course, transepithelial cross-linking avoids these problems, so it is safer. So if you want to answer the question, it is safer, of course it is safer. But there is another question. Is it effective? It works. Uh, so uh, leaving the epithelium there, could we solve the problems, not only the safety problems, but keeping the efficacy? And this is the real problem. Comparing the efficacy of Epion and uh, Epion uh, cross-linking, I made some, uh, some literature review. I picked up some very re recent papers where we uh, wanted to compare Epion versus Epion and more, seeing if the new dev developments of Epion technique, like iontophoresis or intrastrom intrastromal tunnels, could avoid the shortcomings of the Epion technique. So, here in this, in this paper, we, we try, uh, this is a paper from uh, the, uh, last year in uh, French Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, the purpose was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of both types of uh, Epion versus Epioff. And in the conclusions, we see that although Epioff is safe and well tolerated, does not uh, stop the progression of keratoconus. So, in other words, it does not work. Another paper, this one also uh, showing the results, this from the Siena group that had a, a, lot, a lot of uh, experience in young people uh, with keratoconus with cross-linking, and of course shows us that after epion cross-linking, the keratoconus instability still remained. So it, was, it did not work also in this group compared to the epioff technique. And this last one, comparing again uh, EPIOF with EPION, tells us that EPION cross-linking respected subversal and anterior stroma nerve fibers, resulting in safe for the cord endothelium, but the penetration was very limited, and in mid-long term efficacy needs to be uh, assessed again. So these three papers show us that EPION uh, cross-linking does not work, and this is the first conclusion. So there were some difference in technique trying to enhance uh, these results and again trying to, to show us if Epion technique is really interesting. And I show you two more studies. One uh, using the iontophoresis technique uh, to, to increase 
the penetration or, or to suppose to increase the penetration of the epion technique, but again, you see that it was better that without iontophoresis, but does not match, did not reach the concentrations with epiof. Still, it was better than without iontophoresis, but it was not uh, matching the uh, epiof technique. And this one, also uh, with iontophoresis, also from 2014, uh, and says that efficient cross-linking epioff can be achieved for an intact epithelium remains to be demonstrated. So no proof of efficacy. And the last paper, this for Theo Zeiler by the inventor of the, of the cross-linking, where he inject, he created tunnels in the cornea and injected the riboflavin into the tunnels to avoid, uh, the, to, to enhance the penetration uh, of the intact epithelium. But even there, he uh, discusses if it is an, a feasible epion approach for cross-linking. So, in conclusion, epion cross-linking is safer because avoids important complications of epion cross-linking, is patient-friendly, and of course, almost avoiding complications. However, it is not effective as it is epi of cross-linking, and even recent advances like the tunnels or iontophoresis uh, are yet to be proved. So for the time being, as we saw before, I still go with the epi of cross-linking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Antonio. So, he, he, he's as, as usual, Antonio is very precise. He feels that the uh, epithelium on is safer, but is not that much effective. So, we'll hear the second uh, talk uh, with Dr. Hisham Hamdi about uh, cornea collagen cross linking epithelium of that he thinks it is more effective. Dr. Hisham. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome all of, all of you to the fourth coming. I'm Dr. Hisham Hamdi. I'm the organizer for the cornea and refractive surgery sessions. And I um, welcome uh, all the speakers and the audience. Um, I think when I know that Dr. Marino is with me in this debate, I, I said, oh, oh, I am in trouble. So because Dr. Marino is very precise, is a good presenter, so I found that this is difficult, but when he presents, so my presentation will be an addition to his presentation. <clears throat> um, as Dr. Marino uh, explained before, that the standard resident protocol of uh, epi of corneal cross-linking is nine millimeter epithelial removal with riboflavin drops every two minutes for 30 minutes and ultraviolet exposure for 30 minutes. Uh, EPI-OFF is more effective because there is extensive preclinical uh, studies since 1994 and increased in the corneal stiffness, resistance to thermal shrinkage, and OCT and confocal microscopy evidence showed that the haze and demarcation line to the depths up to 300 micron. And there is a numerous prospective controlled clinical trials, so we all know that the results are good regarding epithelial off. Also, the long-term stability was mentioned on all the studies, as, as you see on the... Uh, sorry, what I did. Okay. Um, the... The right side of the slide showed the preoperative in A up to the D after one year. About the APON, there is major questions to be answered. <clears throat> Can we get sufficient riboflavin into the corneal stroma? The second question is, will epithelium uptake of riboflavin adversely impact the outcome? And that can be overcome. And where is the APON corneal cross-linking efficacy data? And there is a conflicting clinical results of APON. There is no long-term randomized clinical trials. There is some favorable results and less favorable, favorable results. 
And uh, there is a nice study in the Journal of Refractive Surgery 2010. They concluded that a limited effect of trans epithelial cross linking was noted in cratoconic eye without complication. The effect appeared to be less pronounced than described in the literature after corneal cross linking. Another one that mentioned by Dr. Marino in the French Journal of Ophthalmology. They conclude that when they are doing a comparison between AP on and AP off corneal cross linking, that the corneal cross linking on, uh, epithelial on, is not effective. What about the results also? Uh, Caprusi et al. in Euro European Journal of uh, Ophthalmology 2012 demonstrated that there is 50% of the cases that need to be retreated again. So you cannot sit with the patient and tell him that I'm doing uh, a procedure that have a failure rate 50%. So this is not acceptable at all but by any patient. Uh, and Rabinovich also demonstrate the right side of the slide that progression of patient who did uh, cratoconus epithelial on. This is one of my patient and as you see by the epithelial off technique, how the cornea parameters improved and the density of the corneal cone. Again, there is a question about the epion technique, about the dependable riboflavin uptake. Corneal cross-linking required the good stroma riboflavin absorption, and epion standard riboflavin and dextran penetrate epithelium poorly because the epithelium is lipophilic while the riboflavin is hydrophilic. Another study in 2012, they concluded that epithelial remover appeared to be essential steps prior to performing corneal cross-linking as intact epithelium appeared to block penetration of riboflavin. And they did a nice study. 10 patients, they did it with complete removal and 10 patients with grid pattern removal. So some area are removed and some area are not removed. And they found by the in vivo OCT that the complete removal is uniform. Again, about the UV dose delivered to the uh, technique of epithelial on. And epithelial on loss of power secondary to UV absorption by the epithelium and riboflavin, and the epithelium lead to approximately 25% of loss. Another thing that the oxygen factors, epithelium may decrease the oxygen diffusion in a stroma and decrease the cross-linking efficacy. So, in AP off and AP on, we demonstrated by the confocal microscopy and the OCT the demarcation line of the haze on the AP on and AP off. So <clears throat> in the AP off, there is fourfold increase in the corneal stiffness because we have a good, nice treatment deep in the cornea, while in the AP on only it is a superficial effect or, of the cross-linking demarcation so there is undetermined increase in the corneal stiffness. And this is, we can see the comparison between AP on and AP off, how the demarcation light is deep in the AP off technique uh, rather than the AP on technique. Again, the confocal microscopy, as you see that epithelial off make gratocyte apoptosis. So, and this is, will make the effect of corneal cross-linking, while in the epithelium on, when they did confocal microscopy after the procedure, the, there is no keratocyte activity at all. So, regarding the complication, we have a delayed healing, which uh, occur about less than 55% of cases, infection less than 0.1%. And this can be handled by any corneal specialist, but the failure is less than 2% in the literature. But the failure in the epithelial only is up to 50%. So there is some future refinement of the AP on to refine the riboflavin formulation to improve stromal uptake, increase UV irradiance or time, facilitate, facilitate oxygen diffusion by pulsed on and off UV, which may allow oxygen diffusion. So this is the future. So in patient safety, the law of medicine stated that in the treatment of any individual where proven intervention do not exist or other known intervention have been ineffective, the physician after seeking expert ex advice 
with informed consent from patient or legally authorized representative may use unproven intervention if, in the physician judgment, it offers hope or saving life. So we don't try on our patient this. So if this is your eye, would you want to have Epion with high rate of failure? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hisham. Uh, so actually in the first uh, uh, two uh, talks now, we uh, had concluded that epithelium uh, off is the best uh, way to treat uh, cases of uh, cross-linking, although it might be a little bit safer, but the effectiveness of the epithelium off is better than uh, the effectiveness of the epithelium on. And this is our target from this uh, procedure. So again, I think we have more audience. So anybody of you in the audience, uh, the, you have uh, the voting tabs or not yet? So again, I'll repeat the question. Do you think removing the epithelium or epithelium off is better in treating cases with uh, keratoconus or keeping the epithelium on? Can you put the question, please? Did you find the uh, question, audience, in these? <clears throat> Ta, prepare your tabs with you so that we can, well, it's with, with, near the registration desk. So uh, we'll move to the uh, next two topics. We are talking again about uh, corneal collagen cross-linking. Do you prefer to do uh, corneal cr cross-linking alone or do you prefer to do it with laser surface ablation? So uh, again, in the debate, we have uh, Dr. Antonio Marenho who will talk about corneal collagen cross-linking alone. Dr. Antonio. more like a conceptual talk on, on my part, because really I have not tried to do cross-linking. This is for keratoconus, of course, you are speaking of keratoconus. I have not tried to do uh, cross-linking combined immediately with PRK. Of course, this is, has been suggested mostly by Canelopoulos with Athens Protocol, but I have my doubts about this, so I did not try it. I'm going to justify why I did not try, and I will again uh, show some literature reviews that maybe corroborate my doubts about this procedure. So, the same, the same again, we, we have been through that, the cross-linking, uh, and the main use for, use for cross-linking, as you know, is to stop the progression of keratoconus and other ectatic corneal diseases, but mainly keratoconus. And keratoconus, as, as we also know, is in most, most cases, almost every case, associated with myopia and irregular astigmatism. We know that. So here we have a, a, a case of a classic keratoconus, you see, and uh, this case astigmatism is not so high, but many, many cases, we have five, six, and more diopters of astigmatism and also of myopia. So the question is this, should we try to correct the metropia, mostly myopia and astigmatism, in keratocon eyes immediately after cross-linking in one session, like the Athens protocol suggests, should we do the cross-linking and wait some time, but like six months, and do the PRK afterwards? Or in the last, uh, uh, the last type, we do the cross-linking, but we don't 
try to do laser vision correction. I agree, and I have seen, uh, seen that, that if the metrope is important, a fake KOL, in my, uh, my opinion, should be safer for these cases. So we did some literature review uh, trying to ask, to answer one important question. And this question is, does cross-linking change the refraction? Because if cross-linking changes the refraction, I don't see how we can correct immediately after the, after, uh, the cross-linking a refraction that will be changed in the future. And another question, should we weaken further uh, already weak cornea? So in this study, that we are have, where we see the results of course linking in long-term results, in six-year results, we see here, and the result that matters to us is that uh, the, refra the, refra the mean refractive uh, spherical equivalent changed about one diopter, from 320 to 2.7 diopters. And everything changed. So if this is long-term. My doubt, perhaps if you have experience, you can enlighten me, but my doubt is how can we apply a procedure if the refraction keeps changing? And in this, uh, another paper, the, it was to, to assess the, ref, the higher order aberration, the topographic, and the refractive outcomes two years after performing the cross-linking. And we see here in the results that this, the difference in spherical equivalent improved significantly. So really, there is even a patient reported by Canelopoulos where he sees a, a, a difference in 10 diopters of refractive uh, of, uh, of myopia, a difference in 10 diopters in a period of five years. So because of this, I don't see, this is a, a, again a conceptual way of thinking. I don't have experience to compare one case to another, but if it changes, how can we uh, correct a thing that is changing? So, in conclusion, cross-linking changes the refraction in eyes with keratoconus. And for me, it's also very controversial to weaken further a weak cornea. So, uh, I, uh, the answer to this question, for me, cross-linking simultaneous with PRK, no. Later, maybe. If you wait for two or three years and see that the refraction is stable, maybe we can do the PRK. But what I, uh, I have done till now is do the cross-linking. If the, ref the residual refractive error is not so important, just leave it like that, uh, correct with glasses or contact lenses. If it isn't important, I use fake KOLs, and I have good results both with the toric artiflex or the toric ICL. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Antonio. As usual, as I said, he's always precise. So, Dr. Annie Thekla thinks that, yes, he can do cross-linking with uh, laser surface ablation. So let's hear what's going to be said by Dr. Hani Thakla. Dr. Hani. Thank you for inviting me among this uh, outstanding panel. They are uploading the presentation. So I'm going to talk about the, our results uh, with the simultaneous topography-guided PRK with accelerated corneal collision cross-linking. Actually, uh, in the... What is oh, Okay. So in uh, September of 2014, we have uh, published a study in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery uh, discussing our results with this technique. And it is considered now an evidence-based medicine. And in the WEC in Tokyo last year, we presented even a bigger series. So I'm going to share with you now our results in our study. So there are two major aspects that we have to address in any keratoconus, the irregular astigmatism and the corneal bio 
mechanical stability. To correct a keratoconus, we have to regularize the cornea and we have to strengthen it. We all agree to strengthen it, we do cross-linking, and to regularize it, either we do additive things like the rings or uh, ablative procedures like the PRK. So is there a uh, role to do both together, the strengthening and the regularizations? So our purpose of this study is to test this. So it's a retrospective study. The data were collected from 31 eyes, and it took us four years to get this published. And the inclusion criteria, keratoconus patients showing some progression. Uh, we should make sure that the, after the maximum ablation depth of 50 microns, we should not leave a stroma of less than 350 microns of thickness, no other corneal pathologies, and the patients were informed about the other alternatives like the rings, like the rings or the uh, keratoplasties. Clinical examination is the routine like in any refractive procedures, and we did the topography-guided PRK using the TCAT uh, program in the IQ400 Allegretto wave light, where we enter the uh, eight pictures from the oculizers, and we have to verify that the, the eight pictures are valid. And then we enter the uh, uh, data of the patients. And here we can look at the ablation pattern. We can see up that here we uh, leave the clinical refraction as zero in all the patients. This is the topo refraction. The topo refraction means with this ablation profile, this is the refractive result that we are going to get after the ablation uh, uh, that we are going to do. And this is the modified that we are going to put it in the program to correct it. It depends on the corneal sickness and the, the refractive error and the uh, visual acuity of the patients. We use optical zone of 5.5, tilt off to reduce the ablation depths, and we have to make sure that the corneal sickness, the remaining, is more than 350. Here we can see that the beauty of this software is that it does at the same time a myopic ablation here in the center on the apex of the cone and hyperopic ablation at the periphery to push the cone in the middle and to regularize the cornea. The surgical procedure we do it under topical anesthesia of course and we use the amoils brush to remove a nine millimeter diameter of epithelium and this is the print out of the treatment uh, plan that we have it here to make sure uh, about all the uh, data. And we apply a mitomycin of 0.02% for 20 seconds at the end of the procedure and we irrigate and we wash the mitomycin with 40 ml. This is the accelerated cross-linking in five minutes and we don't apply riboflavin during the, uh, during the uh, exposure to the UV light uh, during the five minutes. Uh, following the steps of Dr. Uh, uh, Canelopoulos, now we have the Dubai Protocol, which is the topo-guided PRK and the accelerated cross-linking. And uh, it differs than the Chemionis, uh, the CRATE protocol, that this is epithelium of, while he does trans-epithelial PRK using the excimer laser. The post-operative is the routine like in any PRK procedures. The statistics, we looked at the refraction, the uncorrected and the corrected distance visual acuity, the K readings, and we followed up our patients for one year. The results, we have 22 males and nine females. The mean age was 28 years, and all the study parameters demonstrated a statistically significant difference between the preoperative and the postoperative results. This is the uncorrected distance visual acuity. We can see that there is a significant improvement in the uncorrected distance visual acuity over one year, and there was a stability at six months. The corrected distance visual acuity showed a statistically significant, uh, and even the visual acuity tripled after the procedure than before the procedures, and again the stability at six months. The manifest refractive spherical equivalent reduced, and that was because we corrected part of the cylinder during our partial PRK procedures. 
The flat K readings increased in the first months because of the effect of the simultaneous cross-linking, and then again it became flatter and there was a statistically significant difference. The steep gratometry reduced and there was a statistically significant difference at all points. This is the most important slide that I want to share with you, which is the safety of these procedures. None of those eyes had lost any lines of the best corrected visual acuity. While many have gained, almost 30% of the patients gained two or more lines, 16% gained three lines, 25% gained four lines, 20% gained more than five lines. So it's a very safe procedures. These are some of the examples, the preoperative uh, pentacam and the postoperative, and we see the stability of the results over the one year. Another example, we can see the, a complete disappearance of the keratoconus from the topography. Another case, we can see how it softened the uh, shape of the uh, keratoconus in the topography, again. Here we can see that it uh, reduced the uh, steepness and it made the uh, stigmatism regular, refractable, that we can correct it with glasses or with uh, later toric ICLs. So complications, one patient had a delayed healing. It could happen only with cross-linking or with the PRK. And two patients had haze of grade two, young patients, uh, because here we have a strong sun and we uh, warn our patients to avoid the sun for six months after the procedures but his was not affecting the improvement of corrected distance visual acuity it usually happens in the area of the hyperopic corrections in the periphery so simultaneous topography guided prk with cross-linking is safe and effective option to normalize stabilize and visually rehabilitate patients with keratoconus and it's a good alternative other than uh, the corneal rings or the cross-linking alone or the uh, keratoplasties. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Hemi. So we saw now the both sides of the uh, debate. Uh, and I think if we can uh, put the question on now. Do we, uh, what do you think? Do you think uh, cross-thinking can be done uh, with or without uh, laser surface ablation? Question? Okay, until we have the results, yes. Dr. Antonio. Antonio. Just one, one question. That he said that, that the cross link is not stable for four years. Uh, I, I just need to, to ask one question. Is that, uh, can we imagine doing cross link for a normal cornea? And what would be that? So do you think, Dr. Antonio, the question is for you? That we imagine that we are doing. Why would you do a cross linking for a normal cornea? Why do we have to do something like this? The effect of crossing is on the highest when the cornea is having any steepness. For example, let us say 65 or 70. We will have the effect of unstable effect on progress in the progression in flattening that K reading. That's right. More than what we have in cornea for 43 or 44. Yeah, so I, I think your point is clear. Uh, uh, what you're saying in brief is that cross uh, uh, 
surface ablation before cross-linking will help the effect, will stabilize the cornea. The point is there is no long-term uh, results published in peer-reviewed literature so far showing the safety of doing cross-linking uh, after with surface ablation combined at the same time. Maybe in the future we, we, we can say that this is safe, but so far, to the best of my knowledge, there is no long-term follow-up showing that this is safe. And there is no long-term follow-up after, even after surface ablation with the PRK or PTK, proving that uh, uh, surface ablation uh, increases or stabilizes the cornea, but it's exactly the opposite. So you want Dr. Marino, uh, you want Dr. Antonio to answer on uh, this question? Antonio presented it? Yes. Antonio, so the question is for you. Uh, Okay, go ahead. I agree with you. I may agree with you, but uh, the, the K readings, one thing is the principle. Maybe, maybe you, we can agree that you can do that if the keratoconus is not so advanced. If it is advanced, you, you, you may not do it. My point is, and I said before, I, I have not done it. I cannot uh, contest with my own results. But uh, really what, what I see is that in advanced keratoconus, there is a progressive difference in the spherical equivalent without doing any uh, NPRK. Probably if you have that uh, other results, I, I will not contest you. I may agree with you. I think that was a really very interesting discussion, and you can go endless on this topic. Now, the voting of the audience came out now with like uh, three to one with uh, cornea cross-linking without uh, doing laser ablation. Okay, that's great. So now we're going to go to the uh, move to the next uh, uh, presentation by um, Dr. Jorge Alio from Alicante, Spain. Uh, Dr. Alio is going to present the uh, cross-linking in the treatment of infectious keratitis. Jorge, please. Mr. Khir, and we're well, happy to be here. Thank you for this invitation again. Uh, the topic of this presentation is how to use collagen cross-linking as a therapeutic tool in coronary infection. First of all, we are dealing with an important topic. The World Health Organization has identified as a cause of coronal blindness infectious keratitis, and indeed the infectious keratitis needs a very intensive and energetic treatment that usually ends in a leukoma and ends in coronal transplantation. But it's not about this. Many of these eyes are lost in the track because in the third world there is no availability many times of the very specific protocols for anti-infective agents, especially for fungal infections that are necessary. So it is true that we are dealing with a blinding disease in which we need an aggressive management and indeed in which uh, to have another tool that could be uh, easy to access, cheap and definitely effective could be an immense value. So we are dealing with a current cross-linking. We know that this is, has been created to increase the stiffness of the cornea and increasing the stiffness creates chemical bonds and we know that this effect is not immediate. It takes some time and the, the maximum effect is achieved after three months of the therapy. 
question. Okay. Very good. And we have a, a protocol that at this moment is the one that is usually used, is the one that we shall deal about this later on, and is the Trojan protocols. All the other protocols are, are indeed under experimental clinical use, or a, there is a lack of clinical evidence to be used for other purposes rather than for cross-linking in the specific cases. What is true is that we have an, 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 an evidence that uh, the keratocytes are affected by the ultraviolet light, and we know that this is uh, happening to bacteria because in many uh, environments, including the operating rooms, we use ultraviolets to sterilize the environment. So we have a cytotoxicity that really tells us about the bacterial bactericidal effect that current cross-linking could have. So we have this uh, issue, and indeed we have questions about the use of, of ultraviolet light in the form of cross-linking for the purpose of treating coronal infection. The, the first question is, does it work? Is it useful for my patients? Is it going to help my patients with coronal infectious uh, ulcers? Which more microorganisms are more sensitive? We know that there's a variety of them, and some of them can be or not sensitive to the, to the ultraviolet light, and this has to be known before uh, applying it properly. Which is the size and the depth effectivity of the treatment? Because uh, the infection is not on the surface, it's in the deep stroma, sometimes it's penetrating the whole cornea, and this might uh, suppose a limitation to the use of cross-linking. When is to perform it? Is it to be used early? Is it late? Is it to be used just after the failure of previous treatments? Which are the collateral positive effects? Because it might be that we have not only cross-linking as a bactericidal effect, it might be that we have something else in our hands to improve the outcome of these patients. And uh, which are the complications and secondary negative effects? Because for sure, this technique has negative effect in, as a collagen cross-linking uh, device for the keratoconus, and it might be that we have a similar or different for the use as an effective therapy. But which is the treatment protocol? It's going to be the same like in current cross-linking, and which is the number of sessions if can be repeated? All these questions are the questions I have when I started using current cross-linking in infectious uh, coronary diseases, and indeed some of them have been answered already partially by our work. Uh, probably this is the, the, the paper published in ophthalmology by an Egyptian group uh, in a multicentrical study that really offers the evidence that we are dealing with a therapy that is complementary and adds value to the anti-infective therapy, and even that it can be not totally uh, as isolated tool effective as an anti-infective therapy, definitely is helping those patients who have been assisted by this in, uh, in coincidental use with the, with the antimicrobial medication. But it's true that we have some uh, evidence in vitro before this paper. We have this study that proved that riboflavin with ultraviolet was effective in vitro against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, aureus methylsin resistant, very important germ because we have nothing to do, almost uh, only uh, vancomycin today against it, about Pseudomonas aeruginosa, multi-resistant, one of the worst uh, uh, agents that we might have in a coronal ulcer, Staphylococcus aureus, multi-resistant as well, and in this uh, source series of cases confirmed initially that this was true. And about the bacterial uh, pathogen effect, we know that Pseudomonas aeruginosas and Staphylococcus aureus and Epidermidis, it is indeed a, a, a block in the growth by correct cross-linking, but we know in this same uh, paper that is referred here, that is ineffective uh, uh, against the Candida albicans, which indeed uh, gives to us a perspective about what is going to be more effective as bactericidal. Indeed, this is stopping the, the growth, and in Candida, it seems that it's not effective in vitro. And in fungal agents, very important problem because many of them are very difficult to treat. There is no efficacy for candida albicans, no benefits in moderate fungal uh, keratitis above medical treatment. This is important because since that this is not as good as, as antifungals, but not worse. And what is true is that the, 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 the ulcer is closing ear earlier in those cases in which this therapy is used uh, in fungal keratitis. Uh, in, in the pathogen effect on rabbit model have been demonstrated and is coincidental with the studies that have been performed in vitro. So it's true that if you have experimental models of all these different uh, fungal or bacterial agents and candida, they reflect that it has a bactericidal effect, but not in, so important, but definitely uh, existing. It, it, it stops the growth of the ulcer and the healing process is accelerated. 
What is true is that the cantumiba, the, this, the, this therapy has no effect on the antitrophothrite, so we have the cyst untouched. And in the, indeed, in cantumiba, which is a very specific and for problematic disease to treat, uh, there are four cases report, and it has good evolution. And one of the important issues is that the pain is very much decreased. It's important to remember that all viral diseases have to be a contraindication for cross-linking because uh, perforations and aggravations of these problems have been uh, detected, so we have to rule out any herpetic background of the patient before using chlorine cross-linking. This is the bactericidal effect, but we know that uh, we have other effects in chlorine cross-linking, which is indeed the inhibition of the metalloprotease cascade. And it's true that this was demonstrated initially by Spurl uh, because digestion by trypsin could uh, happen much less important in cross-link corners than in co those corners that were not cross-link. Uh, so we have that one arm is that we have incredible cross-linking that inactivates the DNA and the RNA of the pathogens, causing lesions in chromosomal strands and leading to an efficient microbial growth inhibition and bactericidal effect. But on the other side, we have uh, the, uh, the induction of stromal fibrin bonds and indeed they, uh, they, they develop the cornea as more resistant to collagen degrading enzymes. So we have bactericidal and a, a treatment that consolidates the cornea in these very difficult and specific uh, situations. And this paper and this proves that because these patients treated coincidentally with current cross-linking were less prone to, to perforate, the healing process was accelerated and the ulcer was closed much uh, earlier than in those that were not treated with current cross-linking. Let me give to you now my, uh, in my experience and let me show to you this initial case that we had. We were uh, referred a 30 year old man uh, wearing contact lenses. He was visiting uh, the Philippines and he was taking a bath in a lake. And uh, following this, and three uh, weeks after topical, uh, and a few, few uh, days after this, he started with a corneal ulcer. And uh, when we had the case in our office, the patient was present for three weeks. Uh, he had been uh, treated with multiple topical therapy with antibiotics, antifungals mentioned here, and even corticosteroid, and the vision was hand motions. The patient was with very severe pain, intensive hyperemia, total coronary infiltrate, and a very deep uh, ulcer. This is the, the aspect of the patient in the moment that we received, definitely was a desperate case. This was the aspect, as you see, we, we had at that moment the invasion of the, of the vessels, and you have the, in the global aspect that this patient is a very severe condition. Uh, we, did, we did direct examination on the, uh, immediately with a coronal biopsy, and we uh, used the stain with calcofluor white, and you, we used on the deflorescent microscope, and we could see that the filamentous fungus was present. This patient had negative uh, uh, cultures uh, elsewhere, and we did, didn't want to lose the time. And so you see here that we were dealing with something that was most probably Fusarian species, and we were uh, treating it as a Fusarian. So the patient was uh, treated with voriconazole, a topical and oral. This is uh, the policy that we follow in these cases. And we decided immediately to use collagen cross-linking. That was the decision initially to treat with antifungal, systemic and topical, and with collagen cross-linking. The real thing is that one week after this cross-linking, the same biopsy performed on second occasion with the same stain demonstrated a tremendous decrease in the number of filaments and also that these filaments were broken in, uh, in most of the cases. Definitely we had an evidence of therapy that was probably not only related to the therapy with antifungal but because of the physical therapy with cross-linking. Uh, the patient was follow-up and then we had uh, this, third, uh, this is, there was the moment in which we did the biopsy look that we had at this moment the, uh, the second therapy. We took a sample and did immediately. We did a second cross-linking in this patient. To do the cross-linking is indeed uh, something that you see here that with a different eye. This, the cornea looks much more dry, <clears throat> looks much more consistent. Definitely this is not the melting aspect of the cornea that we had before. And indeed the aspect of the patient was much improved. The patient has less pain and even the hyperemia has been reduced. So there was a dramatic improvement in symptoms following the second uh, cross-linking. The corneal remained opaque, but there was a large decrease in inflammation. The corneal did not melt, and remember at the beginning it was melting, and the patient was under observation. And finally, we had a good uh, anatomical and visual outcome after six months when we performed an unstable condition with no inflammation, uh, the adequate epineutic keratoplasty. Let me show to you other cases. This is another case. This, this was 
uh, also a fungal uh, keratitis. Look uh, here at the, uh, at the post progressive evolution after one session of cross linking. This is a second case of a cantumiba keratitis that is a partial indication. But look here that from here to, th to this, this point, the patient in, in one month did a very important and improvement. In this case, it was in two weeks leading almost to disappearing of the infection, and indeed the leukoma was very much controlled. A look here, <coughs> which was a candida albicans case, acantomyba keratitis, excuse me. This acantomyba was in multiple sites, was a, a very severe. We took the patient from the very beginning and without any other therapy uh, needs, uh, that was used other than the cross-linking. This is the aspect that the patient had after one month of therapy. A look here, the evolution from here to here, second cross-linking, and to the end. So we were stimulated by our outcomes, and we did a meta-analysis. And we went, and with, uh, and you can uh, read this paper published by us, I'm the first author, in a journal of thermic inflammation and infection. And indeed, the, this meta-analysis demonstrated in 12 articles that we had uh, something uh, in our hands that was really important. As you see, in this meta-analysis, we could identify treatment in all type of, of uh, microbial agents, from gram-positive and negative, fungus at acantomyba, and even culture negative which is a frequent issue that happened in our practice. Yes. Well, we, have, we have one more minute. Thank you very much. Well, just to summarize, the, uh, we had in all the, these cases the evidence that healing was faster, and those patients treated with cross-linking were uh, having a much uh, faster evolution as well. It's not cross. Okay. So the complications were coronary compensation, herpes reactivation, and coronary scarring. And uh, the efficacy, the conclusions, and let me finish the, the presentation with this. First of all, it, it avoids corneal melting. It does is a short, it, it is controversial, but it seems that shorten the healing time and definitely causes a decrease in pain. In terms of the abscess death, this, if the surface is involved, definitely the treatment is, is effective. But if, the, if, if we have a deeper stroma on the thelal infiltrate, the, the, the problem will be only partially uh, treated by this due to the opacity and the death of the infiltrate. And in susceptible microorganisms, definitely from the peer review literature, is bacterial or type fungus, definitely. Acantomyba is effective, but with a question mark because not in all hands, and is contraindicated in a herpetic background. So recommendations, these are the, the ones that I do, a superficial abscess with poor outcome, in, with melting coronary thickness with more than 400 microns. Poor outcome after two weeks of treatment definitely for me is an indication. We exclude cases that are closer to one millimeter from the limbus because we, you are going to, to cause a destruction of the limbal stem cells. History of herpes and coronary thickness of, three, of less than 400 microns unless you use hypersmolar riboflavin. The safety is still under debate, but it seems to be a safe, a, a safe a treatment. Specific protocol doesn't exist. We use a dressing protocol. The number of sessions is unlimited. We have performed up to four sessions with good results, and indeed, we are in an area that needs further investigation. Thank you very much for the kind attention. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Jorge. Excellent work on a very, on a very tough subject. Uh, on the same theme, we're going to invite our next speaker, Dr. Rich Abbott. Uh, we're talking on the update on the diagnosis and management of the infe of infectious keratitis. Dr. Abbott, please. Thank you, Dr. Ella. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, I'd like to uh, talk to you about some of the uh, latest medical and surgical strategies for the diagnosis and management of uh, bacterial keratitis. So we'll keep my comments to uh, bacteria and not... Uh, fungus or acanthamoeba. And I need the next slide. Thank you. And the next. And the next. So we'll discuss uh, briefly the epidemiology, diagnosis, some of the evidence-based uh, choice of antibiotics, uh, the topic of uh, resistance, which is a big topic. Uh, Cross-linking, I think you've heard a nice discussion on, so we won't spend any time on there. And then uh, some of the controversies in the use of steroids and uh, uh, healing of non-epithelial uh, uh, epithelial defects. So there are approximately a half million cases of microbial keratitis reported annually worldwide. This is uh, a major problem for us. And 
uh, over a million people are affected globally with uh, decreased uh, vision from this problem. If left untreated, uh, you will see progressive tissue destruction, uh, corneal perforation, and even endophthalmitis with loss of uh, vision. 90% uh, of all cases of acute bacterial keratitis are caused primarily by uh, the two gram positives, staph and strep, as well as pseudomonas and enterobacteria. And uh, so about 55% have a positive uh, gram stain, uh, 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 a gram positive, and 45% uh, are gram negative uh, for bacterial keratitis. It's obviously crucial that you need to make the diagnosis uh, by determining the etiology, and uh, that will give you successful treatment, we hope. The challenge for all of us is how rapid we can make this diagnosis uh, and then initiate a therapy that will eliminate these organisms so that we don't get a lot of structural damage uh, in the cornea, like the desmetacil you see in this photograph. <clears throat> Typically, the diagnosis is based on the clinical appearance of the ulcer uh, and then laboratory confirmation, including uh, smears and stains, uh, culture, of which 50% are false negatives. And it takes two to three days to get the results, as well as the role of molecular biology like PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. <clears throat> the advantages of PCR is that it's a gold standard in infectious uh, diagnosis. It has the highest specificity and sensitivity, and it can amplify small amounts of bacterial DNA. Uh, it can also identify an organism pretty rapidly, usually within about one hour. So it's very helpful uh, in virology, uh, and the yield tends to be a little better in fungal keratitis, but in bacterial keratitis, uh, we found it hasn't been as useful as we uh, like. The disadvantages with PCR is that it's, uh, the kits are, tend to be specific for virus uh, and bacteria, but they're really not practical for bacteria because um, it requires many different uh, primers to amplify the different genes, and uh, there's a, a high sensitivity can be a negative in that if the bacteria is dead in the cornea, uh, you still have uh, the DNA around, and these are considered contaminants. Uh, the costs are high, and it does require uh, specific expertise in your lab if you're going to do PCR. And if you're staining the cornea, the fluorescein dye interferes with the outcome of the PCR test. So um, we use it as an adjunct to uh, cultures. So just uh, when you look at the options for diagnosis, uh, clinical appearance, you can easily be put, fooled, uh, and so that's always not a good choice. Uh, for laboratory, confirma laboratory confirmation, there are a lot of false negatives with smears and stains and cultures, uh, plus it's very slow uh, in giving us the answer. And as I mentioned with molecular biology, uh, there are many hurdles. So I think all of us then would start off our treatment with broad spectrum uh, antibiotics as the, the way to proceed. Uh, so what does the evidence-based uh, literature uh, say about our treatment and our diagnosis of this problem? Well, the clinical guidelines are widely accepted as best practices, and at the American Academy, we have studied bacterial keratitis very closely and reviewed the literature, and let me just show you what we found. And the ICO guidelines are based on the uh, AAO guidelines. So these are uh, evidence-based recommendations from the peer-reviewed literature, and they provide a broad guidance for uh, our pattern of practice. So this is what the guideline looks like for bacterial keratitis, and it was updated in 2013. 
And the summary basically says that the, the uh, standard of treatment are topical antibiotic drops uh, using broad spectrum therapy, using initial loading dose of antibiotics, and then modify the treatment after 40, 48 hours. And that uh, topical steroids should be withheld in general uh, until the infection is under control. So by choosing the most effective antibiotic to treat or prevent an ocular infection, we get more rapid killing of bacteria and so there's less chance for structural damage to the cornea and that's scarring and synechia and adhesions. And that's what you want. You want to be able to rapidly kill the bacteria and avoid structural damage. And also, it'll increase patient comfort uh, with more ra rapid resolution of the problem with a shorter course of therapy, less chance for toxicity, and your patients, of course, will be happier. So a goal, then, is to achieve the highest uh, concentration of antibiotic at the infection site for a very rapid eradication of the infection while minimizing tox toxicity. All of these medications are potentially toxic to the cornea. So when you have these various infections and you can look at these and say, you know, is this fungus, is it bacteria, is it gram-negative, is it gram-positive, and you can make an argument for any one of these with each of these slides. But what you really need to do is use broad spectrum coverage until the etiology is confirmed. The ideal antibiotic would have a broad spectrum with very low resistance, with excellent penetration into the eye, excellent solubility, very rapid onset with low toxicity, and be uh, compatible with other uh, drugs. So this, uh, I'm sure you can't read this in the back, but this is the list of antibiotic therapy for bacterial keratitis from the clinical guidelines. And uh, what you'll see here, and it breaks down, you know, gram-positive cocci, uh, the gram-negative rods, uh, gram-negative cocci, and so forth. And um, we can see that no single antibiotic is effective against all bacterial species uh, causing microbial keratitis and that we tend to use four to five antibiotics such as uh, the cephalosporins, vancomycin, the aminoglycosides like tobramycin, and so forth, in combination with one of the later generation fluoroquinolones. Now, if you look here at the recommendations from the literature, you'll see that for every one, there's a later generation fluoroquinolone recommended. So um, this is usually moxifloxacin, gadifloxacin, or levofloxacin. So for the broadest spectrum of coverage with the highest penetration and concentration in the cornea and the lowest toxicity, we would choose one of these later generation fluoroquinolones in combination with one of the fortified antibiotics. Now, bacterial resistance is a major problem, and it can be prevented by all of us by appropriate treatment and dosing schedule. For the fluoroquinolones, we have shown in our lab that it's really important that you use high concentrations with a high dose frequency. You should never, you should never treat with the fluoroquinolone less than four times a day. So you don't want to taper below four times a day. You can start at every hour, go to every two hours, go to every four hours, but never drop below four times a day or you'll build the chance for resistance. The maximum time course should be no more than about three weeks and uh, always use a highly soluble drug and limit the duration of dosage. If you treat too long or you're using a toxic antibiotic, you can get toxicity. And it, a lot of the referrals we see at the Proctor Foundation in San Francisco are eyes that are treated for long periods of time with multiple antibiotics. And often the question is, is there a secondary infection? Is, is the infection getting worse or is it toxicity? And uh, this is what a toxic cornea typically looks like. So you have to balance the treatment 
between uh, an effective treatment and also limiting toxicity. Well, let me just spend a few minutes on adjunctive therapies, and these tend to be controversial, and I'll just tell you what uh, I think the latest thinking is on steroids, uh, in the use of infectious keratitis, contact lenses, cross-linking, uh, therapeutic grafts, uh, lid surgery, uh, and so forth. So steroids and bacterial keratitis, always uh, controversial. Uh, our institution, along with Aravind, did a study which was uh, published in the Archives of Ophthalmology in 2012 looking at or trying to answer the question, is there improvement in clinical outcomes with the use of topical corticosteroids as adjunctive therapy in the treatment of bacterial corneal ulcers? And this was a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-masked, multi-center trial comparing prednisolone phosphate 1% to placebo as adjunctive therapy. And all these patients had uh, culture positive bacterial corneal ulcer and received 48 hours uh, topical late generation fluoroquinolone antibiotic. The outcome measure was either improvement in the best spectacle corrected vision at three months or reduction of the scar size, re-epithelialization and, and corneal perforation. And the conclusion was that there was no overall difference in three months in improved uh, best correctable vision, and there were more severe ulcers, and central ulcers had a slightly better visual acuity uh, when uh, the steroids were used. So uh, basically, uh, there were no uh, adverse effects, but no overall difference. If you're going to use steroids, my criteria are there's pressive uh, progressive stromal necrosis while receiving maximum antibiotics, or the patient has come to you already using steroids and now there's a rebound stromal, stromal keratitis. And in these cases, you may be forced to use topical steroids. What about bandaged soft contact lens? We'll use them uh, with persistent non-healing epithelial defects after the infection is under control, or if there's severe stromal melting or ulceration, uh, do not fit the lens too tight, and make sure you continue your antibiotic therapy over the contact lens. You've heard a very nice talk about uh, corneal cross-linking from uh, Professor Alio. And uh, this, I think he covered everything uh, nicely, so I'm not going to uh, repeat this, but I think it's something that we need more work on, and uh, I'm very interested to see what will happen and what the recommendations will be in the future as uh, we get more experience with infectious keratitis and cross-linking. What are the causes of a poor therapeutic response? Well, if you start treating a cornea with far advanced disease prior to any therapy, or you have inadequate dosage of antibiotics that you're using, or you're getting drugs toxicity from what you're giving the patient, or there's acquired drug resistance uh, of the organism and you need to make a change, or there's an unrecognized mixed infection. So all of these can be causes of poor uh, response to your treatment. Let me just say a few words about therapeutic keratoplasty and some principles to remember. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it earlier rather than later. Uh, on the lower left is an acanthamoeba infection, which I grafted before it got out to the periphery, and we had a very nice outcome. On the lower right is a fungal keratitis, uh, waited too long before we got the case and eventually spread into the sclera and the eye had to be enucleated. You need to do a large graft, you need to maintain antimicrobial therapy, often treat systemically with antibiotics and watch for recurrence. We try to minimize the use of steroids in these cases but only use them uh, uh, after the graft and in low doses to try to uh, keep the graft from rejecting. 
You should use uh, general anesthesia in these cases, always with an interrupted suture, not a running suture. Try to avoid removing the lens uh, as it acts as a natural barrier to infection going posteriorly. And uh, send a specimen for culture and special stains to help you uh, with the diagnosis. Uh, the outcomes of therapeutic deep lamellar keratoplasty and penetrating keratoplasty for advanced infectious keratitis was nicely compared in this study uh, published in Ophthalmology in 2009. And the bottom line is that a therapeutic deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty compared to a penetrating therapeutic graft, the outcomes were pretty similar and that there was no increased risk of disease recurrent in the therapeutic deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. And there have been several studies now to support this. So just finally, a few comments on some helpful clinical hints and questions that I get asked all the time that I think uh, maybe you've thought about and I'll just give you my opinion. So when to culture in bacterial keratitis? Uh, the recommendation is you should culture most of the time. Are there any exceptions? Well, contact lens associated keratitis where the infiltrate is less than 1.5 millimeters in size. There's no hypopian, there's no other risk factors. It's peripheral, as you see in those photographs. We would just use monotherapy with a late generation fluoroquinolone and not culture these, and usually they respond very nicely. Always culture uh, ulcers, even if they're very small, if they're central, or if the patient is diabetic or associated with any other in immunocompromised situation, uh, or if the patient is poorly compliant. Um, these cases can get worse. They're in the middle of the cornea, so we would culture these. Do not tap the eye if a hypopian is present. Uh, this is a sterile inflammatory reaction to keratitis. We've seen more cases where there's a hypopian with a sterile, with a infected cornea and a needle is put in the anterior chamber and in fact what you've done then is introduce bacteria into the anterior chamber and actually given the patient an endophthalmitis. So please do not tap the eye if there's a hypopian and an infected corneal ulcer. It's a sterile inflammatory response. Uh, management of post-infectious non-healing epithelial defects, uh, a lot of risk factors, as you can see on this slide, from dry eye to diabetic keratopathy, neurotrophic ulcers, herpetic infections, et cetera. <clears throat> the less ag aggressive treatment would be uh, lubrication, uh, stopping the medications, uh, punctal occlusion to restore or retain as many tears as possible, a bandage lens, pressure patching, and sometimes debridement of surrounding epithelium that can have a mitotic arrest and these cells can't heal the defect. <clears throat> More aggressive treatment would include amniotic membrane, autologous serum, or even fetal cord uh, serum, uh, limbal stem cell transplant, uh, scleral lenses, and uh, sometimes uh, some new topical compounds that contained uh, wound healing and anti-inflammatory substances from the fibrinogen healing pathway. So there's a lot of research going on in this area. This would probably be, well, if we get a good medication, it'll probably be approved as an orphan drug through the FDA and other uh, bodies like the FDA. And just finally, uh, is there a role for antibiotics in eyes with viral, uh, viral keratitis? Many times patients come in with a herpes uh, infection and they're also on an anti topical antibiotic. And uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, we don't think it's a good idea. It just further toxifies the cornea. And so treat the, the herpetic infection, the epithelial defect with uh, your antivirals, either systemically or topically, but you do not have to add an, a bacterial, uh, antibacterial uh, agent. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Rich. Um, our last talk 
for this session, and then we'll have a few minutes of discussion. Uh, Dr. Hisham Hamdi, uh, Herpes Simplex Infection Treatment, Oral and Topical. Until Dr. Hisham gets ready, I just want to remind you that if you want to be a member of the AAO and, uh, or the International Society of Refractive Surgery, this is the best time to do it, at the beginning of the year, so you can enjoy all the benefits of the membership throughout the whole year. And we have a, a, an AAO table outside. You can, uh, Ms. Jane Aguili can help you through the process of uh, uh, registration to become a member for AAO and or ISRS. Dr. Hamdi, please. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, my last topic today is about treatment of herpes simplex virus infection. Should we use oral versus topical antiviral? As we all know that herpes simplex virus keratitis, either epithelial, stromal, or endothelial, Regarding the epithelial keratitis, it starts by punctate keratitis. It is the earliest stage of epithelial keratitis with a small punctate vesicular epithelial lesion which coals in lakes that enlarge into dendrites. And it is rarely seen. Then the most common presentation of epithelial keratitis is the dendritic keratitis, dichotomous branching with terminal bulbs and the epithelial defects stain with fluorescein. The peripheral cells lining the dendrites are often raised, contain the active virus and the stain with rose bengal. When the dendrites resolve, scarring occur. Uh, in immunocompromised patient, or if the, patient, uh, the case of dendrites is neglected or untreated, it may enlarge or change to geographic keratitis. Then we came to the stromal keratitis. We have two kinds of stromal keratitis, either interstitial keratitis, which is isolated inflammation to corneal stroma without tissue necrosis or ulceration. There may be stromal thinning with vascularization, but the most important thing is that your corneal epithelium is intact. Then we go to the more aggressive form of stromal keratitis, which is a necrotizing keratitis often begins in the periphery and moves centrally, leaving thin, scarred, and vascularized cornea behind as it migrates, and the epithelium is typically ulcerated. It is one of the most serious complications for the uh, stromal keratitis. It leads to perforation, may result from active viral stromal infection or immunological reaction to vital antigen. Then we came to the last uh, type of keratitis is the endothelial keratitis, which is uh, called discoformic keratitis. It appears with the epithelium and the stromal edema directly overlying discrete oval or round areas of endothelial edema with large keratic precipitates associated with anterior chamber cells. And the corneal endothelium can be diffusely involved, in which case the condition may be difficult to diagnose from Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. So the available treatment for the herpes simplex virus keratitis as a topical or older, we have the trifluoridine 1% in US, uh, while acyclovir and gancyclovir, we have like acyclovir 3% ointment in Europe and Middle East, gancyclovir in Europe and USA, and the oral either acyclovir, valacyclovir, or famcyclovir, The treatment option for epithelial keratitis, we can use topical or oral, stromal, topical or oral, plus steroids, and the endothelial keratitis also either topical or oral plus the corticosteroid, but in prophylaxis for the recurrence, we should use the oral antiviral. So the question now, which to use, the topical or the oral one? So we will talk about first the toxicity. There is a toxicity uh, evident in the topical trifluoridine, very toxic, but topical gancyclovir and acyclovir is, are less toxic, but they cause blurred vision and irritation. While oral acyclovir, there is no ocular surface toxicity, and uh, you can adjust the dose if there is any renal insufficiency. What about the penetration? The next question. Uh, British Journal of Ophthalmology, 1984, found the authors found that oral 
a cycle of air reaches the therapeutic level in tears, corneal stroma, and in the anterior chamber. What about the stromal and endothelial keratitis, topical versus oral? For the topical treatment, it needs more prolonged therapy with more toxicity, and the penetration for them is very bad. Trifluorodine does not pass beyond the corneal epithelium, while gangocyclovir and acyclovir do not reach the effective dose for herpes simplex virus in the anterior chamber, and this is evidenced by the Journal of Ocular Pharmacology, 1994. Um, what about the adverse effects of the topical gancyclovir versus acyclovir? <clears throat> Both of them have caused blurred vision, eye irritation, punctate keratitis, congenital hyperemia, and this is mentioned in four studies. Um, the herpetic eye disease study <coughs> uh, mentioned uh, or published in 1997 in Archives of Ophthalmology concluded that topical steroids was prophylactic topical antiviral effective for herpes simplex keratitis. Long-term or cyclovir reduced rate of recurrent herpes simplex keratitis. And there is another study in the Journal of Chemotherapy 2006. They make a, a comparison between oral versus topical antiviral, and they conclude that there is significant faster healing with the oral therapy than the topical acyclovir. Also, there is a very nice study <coughs> which uh, explained the community-based survey of treatment pattern of herpes simplex virus keratitis in archives of ophthalmology 2010. And they found that 25% of cornea specialists prefer oral over the topical antiviral for the treatment of epithelial keratitis, while 60% of the cornea specialists prefer oral over the topical one. So the, this is the initial oral therapy that uh, we are using uh, for our patient regarding the different types of keratitis, either dendritic, geographic, interstitial, form, and valcyclovir and famvir are good alternative to oral cyclovir. So the indication for using the oral anti antiviral will cover a lot of indications, including primary herpetic disease, stromal and endothelial keratitis, iridocyclitis, immunocompromised patient, pediatric patients with refractory disease, post keratoplasty and neurotrophic disease. Zotabias, if the patient has no any uh, contraindication to use the oral, I prefer the oral because there is no ocular surface toxicity, so, and oral acyclovir is very safe and effective. The herpes simplex virus infection, we should know that this is a systemic disease which affect the central nervous system and sometimes the skin. So the systemic antiviral will treat the skin and the eye together. And it is well tolerated with excellent penetration into the cornea stroma and the anterior chamber. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sham. Uh, uh, now we have a few minutes for a few questions. Any questions for the last three speakers? Uh, please. Yeah. So the question is, would you remove the epithelium when we treat infection with cross-linking? Yes, this is a very important question. We remove the, with a wet sponge all the air surrounding epithelium, and uh, we try to, to clear up to the clear corner. So all they are involved by the inflammation or visible opacity is removed from the epithelium. The David is double. One, you, we, we remove the partially the, the necrotic tissue and the infection, because remember the infection is definitely uh, active in some of them at the, at the edges. And second, you have an increased penetration of the drug. 
This is important, especially in fungal keratitis. You have to remember fungal keratitis if we use amphotericin B. Amphotericin B sensitizes the, 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 the fungal uh, cell membrane to the penetration of riboflavine, and so riboflavine activated by crosslinking is increasing the, the antifungal fungicidal effect by using uh, debridation and the use of amphotericin B. So, the, so we have to remove the methyl. Two weeks. Yeah. Listen, I, m I mentioned resin protocol. We only use that resin protocol. So far, we don't use any other because you have to fix rules, or otherwise, you don't know what you get. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question for Dr. Abbott? Uh, Rich, may I ask you uh, to, to put to shed more light on the indications of uh, keratoplasty in infectious keratitis, when should we uh, do graft, whether lamellar or PKP, in precautions? Uh, I think um, the main indication is when the, the treatment is not working. So uh, assuming you have good compliance from the patient, and that's the key issue. If you're treating the patient as an outpatient and you're asking the patient to take the medication uh, hourly and you don't know that they're doing that, um, your choice is either to put them in the hospital and treat them aggressively that way, and if the condition is worsening, then I move to uh, a therapeutic graft. And uh, more and more we're doing the deep anterior lamellar grafts um, because uh, it, it saves the endothelium. Uh, there's no evidence of recurrence unless it's a fungal keratitis, a very deep infection, and then we'll probably do a penetrating. I, I've gotten a little more aggressive lately than, than before, and so we tend to, if, if we're not getting a good therapeutic response, we will go to a doc. I think I'm going to ask you one question. You mentioned PCR as an expensive technique. We have calculated the cost of PCR, and including the staff, is 100 euros per sample. We use, in every case in which we receive a case treated before with antibiotics, we certainly receive a primary case. This is a problem. And this case is usually, or at least 50 percent in our experience, becomes culture negative. Their observation is fine, but their observation doesn't give to you the, the species. And so we have found PCR to be extremely useful, not expensive at all. It's 100 euros per sample. And we use in every case at this moment. So every case that we receive with previous treatment, we do culture, but we do PCR. And in my opinion, in the very end, we shall use only PCR, because PCR is true that you have false negatives. But it's true that you have a coherence between the, what you find and what you see in the slate lamp. So in our hands, it's becoming quite a, a, a normal practice. And as I told you, it's not as expensive as it looks. It's just an observation. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think PCR will, will become more and more uh, commonly used. I think you, you have to have the facility uh, to, to interpret the, the test. And uh, the, cost, the cost is coming down. But, Basically, we, we are, uh, initially, we are still using broad-spectrum uh, antibiotic, and then if you can get more specificity, especially if you're not sure, is this bacteria, is this uh, a fungus, is this acanthamoeba, uh, sometimes the PCR is, is very, very helpful. And, and I agree that uh, in the future, we will be using more and more of this test. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Uh, last question for Dr. Hamdi. Any questions for Dr. Hisham Hamdi? Okay, Hisham, may I ask you what is your personal approach now with the, if, if you have a patient, first time to see him diagnosed with herpes uh, keratitis, what would you do for uh, I'm going now more to the oral uh, therapy, unless the patient he has any systemic uh, contraindication to oral therapy, because we found that uh, Topical treatment is um, very frustrating to the patient regarding blurred vision. How come, doctor, I will use the a cyclovir ointment five times a day? Uh, I'm working. Uh, uh, it's very difficult for uh, young um, uh, children. Uh, so uh, I found that there is no ocular uh, side effects, to toxicity or something like that. It will be tolerated the 
the patient is uh, improving and there is a very good response. So my tradition now, I'm using all, almost always the oral therapy, unless it's contraindicated. Without topical? Uh, prophylaxis, we are doing this according to the history. You are taking the history from the patient, they will see how much it is frequent for him, the recurrence. So uh, I'm giving, um, especially if it is associated with uh, Creatinoviitis. I'm, I'm giving uh, val acyclovir because it is very tolerated to the patient. Uh, you will give 500 tablets twice a day for one month and then once for three months. And then you will observe the patient how much of the recurrence. But if you face a patient post keratoplasty with herpetic uh, uh, infection, you should uh, put him on uh, the oral val acyclovir for at least one year and sometimes for life. It is a very safe one, if okay. there is no any contradiction. Thank you very much, Hisham. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this concludes our session. Uh, our next session will start at 4 o'clock, uh, LASIK and beyond in the same room. Thank you. Coming up, Coming in, up Hall in Hall A. A. Do you face patients asking for LASIK, but you can't decide whether to perform LASIK or not? And if you will be doing LASIK for them, what would be the best approach for such cases? If this happens to you, do not miss our upcoming thought-provoking session where our expert cornea and refractive surgeons will be discussing patients, patients with, thin with thin corneas. corneas. Do LASIK or not? Patients with dry eye, LASIK or not? Also, our experts will be discussing customized laser surgery. What is the best? Post-LASIK epithelial downgrowth. Remove or do YAG. These interesting topics will be discussed by our expert panelists, Professor, Professor Francisco, Francisco Coronas, Coronas, Medical Director of Coronas Ophthalmology Center, Milan, Italy. Professor, Professor Antonio Mourinho, Porto University, Arabida Hospital, Porto, Portugal. Professor, Professor Carlos, Carlos Martin, Martin, Head of Instituto Ophthalmologico Integral Admiral Vision Group, Barcelona, Spain. Dr. Sharif Emara, Head of Cornea and Refractive Surgery Unit, Magrabi Eye Hospital, Dubai, UAE. Dr. Dr. Hesham Hamdi, Head of Cornea and Refractive Surgery Unit, Magrabi Eye Hospital, Abu Dhabi, UAE. Dr. Dr. Safwan Al Bayati, Medical Director, New Vision Eye Center, Dubai, UAE. Dr. Ala Al Danasori, Chief Medical Officer, Magrabi Hospitals and Centers, Middle East. Professor Jorge Alio, Miguel Hernandez University, Alicante, Spain. Experts will be introduced and the discussion moderated by Dr. Tamer Gamali, Medical Director, Magrabi Eye Center, Al Ain, UAE. Do not miss this upcoming thought provoking session Hello. coming up coming in Hall A. Coming up, Coming next, up next in Hall B, B, would you like to see what posterior segment surgeons do to fix anterior segment surgeons' complications? If you do, don't miss our upcoming thrilling session in Hall B, where our posterior segment experts will be discussing and explaining 